Okay, just while everyone's getting their seat, I'll just do a brief introduction. Uh, our next talk is a comprehensive talk, Hack the Planet, Hackers Influencing Positive Change, uh, and our speaker is Robert Sell. Uh, we've already had uh, one speaker from Trace Labs today, but we now do have Robert, the founder of Trace Labs, uh, which helps to find missing persons across the globe, um, leveraging crowdsourcing to gather intelligence. Um, Robert has previously worked in search and rescue in British Columbia, Canada, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Robert. Thanks very much. Thank much. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, so who has seen this movie? Just quick survey. Okay. Great, great. I was just wondering about the relevance of this still. So that's great. That's going to help me throughout this presentation. So uh, Hack the Planet, Hackers for Positive Change. I've been wanting to do this presentation for a long time, so I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to get this out. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I'm going to. So a little bit about me quickly. So you know my background. So I've been working in InfoSec for about 20 years. Uh, in the aerospace industry uh, in various roles. I've been pretty lucky to be able to move around quite a bit. Uh, I'm currently the founder and president of Trace Labs. Uh, I'm lucky enough to work with Adrian, who you saw this morning. And uh, for the last couple of years at DEF CON, I've been locked in the SC Village uh, doing the CTF there. Uh, last year I was placed third, and the year before that I placed third as well. So if you're thinking about that, uh, talk to me. I'm happy to work with you, tell you what worked for me and what didn't work for me as well. And uh, I'm also a volunteer for Search and Rescue. I've been doing that for about 10 years. And uh, specifically, I focus on tracking and marine rescue. And that's been really rewarding for me as well. Before I go any further, the standard disclaimer, uh, I'm very opinionated. I've got lots of ideas and opinions. And not all of those are right. And um, so none of my ideas are uh, reflect any employer, uh, current, past, or present. So what kind of talk is this? Uh, this is not a technical talk, so if you're expecting that uh, in the Canadian fashion, I'm sorry. Uh, it's really, thank you, it's really uh, um, a call to arms. And it sounds weird, uh, but it's really, hopefully will motivate you to action as I proceed through this. That's really the intent here. Uh, what I'd like to do is essentially weaponize the room and equip you all with some ideas um, that can then hopefully um, take us forward in a more positive direction. Now, I'm a little bit critical of things, I know that, uh, but before I get critical, I want to let everybody know that I'm also super positive. Uh, I think humans are amazing. We have tons of potential. We do some amazing things. I Googled, you know, potential and amazing humans, trying to find an example of that. Um, I found a picture of Paris. I was lucky enough to be in Paris not too long ago. Uh, and I figured that was as good of an example as anything. A city designed for people, as you can see from the picture, just a, a beautiful scenery, beautiful city. Um, but as critical as I am, the, 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 the big message here is that, that we're amazing and I think we can fix all these problems. However, we do have quite a few problems. And um, some of those are big problems. And um, really, I, I contribute lack of ownership to, to some of these problems. Uh, we have this sort of scenario where we often think that, okay, well, those big problems are getting solved by somebody else. Um, you know, the government's working on that. They've got a big team. They've got a big budget. Um, there's nothing that I would need to do as an individual because, you know, they've totally got it under control, right? So that's kind of our mindset quite often is those big issues are solved by big entities. Uh, you know, government or big corporations or, or something like that. And so then we can go and do the stuff that we like to do, which is good because America's Got Talent is on TV and we all want to go watch that, right? Um, we like to be entertained. We really like, you know, to spend time on these sort of things. I'm sorry if you like that TV show. I'm, I'm sure it's amazing. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's other things that we can do besides watching that show. So I'm going to get into a couple examples of some big issues. Uh, global warming. Let's, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, some people will say, well, that's not happening. The earth is flat. There's no global warming. Um, let's just not debate that for a minute. Let's just, you know, say it's a real issue. Um, it's, it's one of the big issues, right? This is something that you could say, you know, it's probably going to get, you know, could bite us later. It could be one of those things that's like, whoa, yeah, this is totally out of control. This is really bad. 
But there's a lot of people working on this right now. The government's working on it. Elon Musk has made some great cars. A lot of you are driving those cars now. So this is probably pretty much solved, I would think, right? Like we're probably moving in a really good direction with this. Um, it's probably pretty much taken care of. Oh no, crap. That's not good. So that, that vertical line is probably not good. So that, this is a bad example. Um, I'm sorry, I probably picked a bad one here. I got a couple others, so let's, let's take a quick look at that. Uh, just forget about this one, okay? So let's look at human trafficking. Again, a lot of people working on this, a lot of, uh, you know, investment, government's working on this. Uh, you know, there's a lot of focus on this in the media. Uh, we see this in the news quite a bit. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that, like this one, I'm pretty sure is almost done. Um, I think we've got a good handle on it. I know that a lot of people, a lot of talented people are working on this. Oh no, wait a minute. That, that's not good either. Um, so this is Canadian data, so I'm sure the American data is better. Um, might be better. So, okay, that's another bad example. Uh, sorry about that. Let's, let's get another one. I got three examples. So fake news, right? This was a big deal in the election. Um, you know, it was, we see a lot about that in the news. But that's over. This has probably gotten a lot better as well, I would expect, right? Oh no, that's, that's not good either. So I, I got some crap examples here, so I'm sorry. All these things are getting worse instead of better. So, and there's a whole bunch of these. I'm not going to go through any more examples because you probably get the idea. There's still a lot of work to do out there. Um, these, this is like a checkerboard of all the big things that could keep you up at night. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the red ones are really bad. Um, so the government is working on this, right? So like this guy here, he's, well, he's not busy right now, but you know, I'm sure he is at some point. Um, if you Google sleeping politician, you'll find a lot. And, um, and this, is, this was one that I used, because I thought it was interesting, right? You've got the guy at the back there. That's going to be a lot of chiropractic treatments in the future. You've got the guy on the, on the side there. I can only see half of his face, but I think his eyes are closed as well. And the guy in the middle, I don't know who the gentleman is, but um, I'm, I'm not sure what he's talking about, but it doesn't give me a lot of confidence uh, that these guys here are solving all our problems. And, um, and I think that that's not a surprise to anybody, I would, I would assume, right? You know, if we take a look at, if we do a little research, and these sources are, are arbitrary, you can, if you don't like these sources, just, you know, we can look at other ones. But the idea here is that government is not necessarily set up to solve all of our problems. And I don't think we should necessarily wait for them to do so. So if that's true, then, then what's the alternative, right? What's, how can we help this situation? So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here really quick and start talking about what hackers are. You know, there's a lot of, we're at a hacker convention, a lot of hackers here, but, but what is this? So if you Google hackers, you, you, you get something like this for pictures, right? You get a lot of gray hoodies, which, you know, I guess is the uniform for hackers. So we've got the gray hoodie, we got some electronics in the background. If we just Google the definition of hacker, we get this definition here, which maybe that's a little more helpful. You know, a person who is uh, unskilled in an activity, no, that's not us. Uh, an expert programmer uh, solving problems, no, that's, that's kind of getting closer, right? Person who illegally gains access, yeah, I don't know. So I, I think this is a pretty crap definition. So let's take a look at some examples that I found. This is the no face hacker. This is very common. You'll see him on the internet a lot. This is the scary mask hacker. So this is a guy, a hacker who's very committed to his craft, right? You have to wear that mask a lot. That's got to be really warm and itchy with a lot of monitors in the background. <laughs> then you've got the anonymous multitasking hacker, right? Like this guy can, can poop and hack at the same time. It's just incredible, right? So I'm being silly. I'm sorry. But, you know, our image on the internet is a bit ridiculous, right? So it's no wonder the media talks about us in these, like has the picture of the gray hoodie all over the place. So let's get a little more realistic. I mean, we, we all have a much better idea of what that looks like. And I tried to trace out, okay, well, what would all the attributes be of a hacker? And these are some of the things that I came up with. This is not a 100% accurate list, of course. It will vary. But when you look at this, some pretty good stuff, right? If I was a hiring manager and you came to me with a candidate, with, with a person with these attributes, I'd be like, yeah, okay, when can they start? So you know, sometimes we're a bit toxic. If you look in Twitter or Reddit or something, we can, we can get into it a little bit. 
But overall, like these are great attributes. I mean, this is, if you had a team of people with these attributes, they could probably solve a lot of problems. But our daily life, we spend with this sort of drama, right? We have the customized logos for every vulnerability. We have the, the news that comes out with all the breaches. Uh, there's all these, uh, all these fires burning, right? There are all, all the CVEs that we have to continually fix. And so our, our, our day to day work is this kind of like, uh, you know, hamster wheel of activity where we're like, okay, okay, close that vulnerability, go patch those systems. So you combine that with our kind of public image, and we've got this weird thing going on, I think, as, as hackers. So I think it's time to kind of take matters into our own hand a little bit and, um, and stop letting everybody else define us and really start to define what hackers are ourselves. And we're much more than gray hoodies and, uh, and, and patching systems, right? It's, it's much more than that. We have red teamers and blue teamers and we're getting more sophisticated in our language. But I think really we have much more to contribute than, than just that. So I'm going to switch gears again real quick. There's a great YouTube video. Um, it's uh, TEDx uh, by this gentleman here and he talks about what makes startups successful. Uh, it's a really short video. It's about 10 minutes. If you times two the speed, it's even shorter. Uh, but I'll, I'll save you the trouble of watching it. He uh, indicates that timing is the most important factor. There's a bunch of other things here like team, the idea, but timing is the most important thing. And I would say that in our evolution as hackers, as we've progressed along that timeline, now is a really good time to start looking at what else we can do out there. And here's some examples of that. So you can see, you know, Tesla, cars that run on batteries. You know, there was a time not too long ago where we, we would have thought that was ridiculous. Uh, learning on demand, YouTube has completely changed the way we learn. Um, bringing strangers into our home to sleep, like who would have done that? Airbnb. Um, random people giving you lifts in their cars. Endless drinks with people that look better online. Right? All these things we would have thought were crazy just not too long ago. And of course today if you look at what's happening, um, there's even more exciting things. And all of these things um, you know, we don't think of them as hackers, the people that are contributing these ideas, but I bet if you meet the people that are doing this, they're going to have those same attributes. So now let's talk about um, my attempt to, to make some positive change here. So this picture here is my team in search and rescue. You can see my hand on the boat there and you can notice that they're in, in no hurry to get me out of the water. Um, they're funny guys. Um, we're doing some, some exercises on the river there. So I, I've been doing search and rescue for about 10 years now. Uh, it's really exciting. They train me in some really interesting things. And uh, one of the things that we do is we look for missing persons. Um, but there's a lot of people that go missing that, that I don't look for. And I've always wondered why that was. And if I'm not looking for them, then, then who is? Uh, and the answer to that is quite often nobody. Um, so then I got into it even more and I wanted to research the, the uh, extent of that problem. And I found that it's, it's quite large actually. There's a lot of people that go missing and, um, and I, you know, not many people are actually looking for them. So to put that in perspective, if you look at everybody that went missing in the U.S. last year, that was basically the same as the population of Las Vegas. So if we take Las Vegas today, like that's all of us, that's all everybody at DEF CON, just make them disappear. You're, you've got 2018 covered, right? That's a lot of people. Okay, so a lot of those people come back, yes, but still like the volume of people there, that's pretty large. So that brings me to the crux of that problem, right? So you've, ha you've got all these people that go missing, you've got the, the, uh, the idea that a lot of those people are going to return back. They're going to come back home within a week. You're going to see a lot of those people return. But then you've also got that sensitive time period that if they don't, you've only got a few hours or a few days rather to get them back. And then after that point it becomes much more difficult. So that's the problem. You're expecting them to come back so therefore you're not, not perhaps investing a lot of resources and then if they don't, then that's really bad news. So to understand the problem, this is kind of what it looks like, right? You can see the prioritization of missing persons pretty much near the bottom and that's 
Not a surprise, right? When you look at violent crime as opposed to missing persons, that's to be expected, right? Violent crime, you pretty want, much want immediate investment, immediate action. So when we look at this, and I look at it globally, I don't look at it regionally like we would with, with most of the, uh, from a law, pers law enforcement perspective, but it's not a priority, of course, right? It's not consistent, so when you look at it globally, it's gonna be different because it's, of course, regional with law enforcement, not transparent by design, because it could be a criminal activity, not scalable, right, of course, because you have to pay people to go do this work, and it's not really cost effective. So if you throw 100 people on salary at each one of these, knowing they're gonna come back anyway, that's not cost effective. So overall, it's not really, it's not effective. So if your loved one goes missing, then you, you should be concerned, right? So how do you solve, how do, what solution would, could you apply to this, right? So thinking about it from a hacker perspective, so the first thing you would want to do is ignore the, the suggested process, the current process. Instead, seek to understand the problem, uh, and then of course let's, let's try to hack that. So the problem, um, you know, talk to many different people. Um, There's many hackers who helped guide this initiative. Um, one person I want to mention, Witch Doctor, um, he's done a lot of work for uh, that industry, for missing persons, um, and provided a lot of ideas around that. Um, buy endless coffees for law enforcement and talk to them about um, how this works currently. And talk to families and loved ones of people that went missing. And of course, that's uh, very emotional and uh, was also very enlightening. Um, and speak to anybody that would listen about the idea and collect all the feedback, of course, that you can as well. And then ignore reasons why it won't work. So, and of course, at the beginning, there's always lots of reasons why your ideas won't work. So we then created a, uh, a website, and uh, we created Trace Labs online with the idea of crowdsourcing for missing persons. So bringing the information security into that sort of law enforcement or search and rescue world. Um, we started off sort of MVP, minimal viable product to try to, we started very small to see if that would work um, and slowly grew from there. And, um, and it slowly gained more and more success to the point where we are today. How did we, we the structure around Trace Labs was we wanted to make sure that it was, it was going to be effective and that it was going to work. So we, d we thought about what's the best way to do that. Of course, with the hacker ethos, one of the, one of the fundamental lines there is make it free, make it open. Um, so Trace Labs is a nonprofit. No one gets paid. It's uh, free labor via crowdsourcing. We don't charge law enforcement for anything we do, so that allows them to scale up. It's cost effective for them. Schools, we're working with schools now um, where we're engaging students with OSINT, whereas they wouldn't have had that opportunity before, especially for hands-on exercises. We go to conferences like this one and do CTFs where we offer a non-theoretical OSINT CTF. Uh, with companies, we've done a few companies where we work with them to provide their employees with OSINT training through our CTF as well. That's been very successful. And then ease of entry. So there's no cost. People don't have to pay for this to participate. All you need is a computer and an internet connection. Then, of course, make it fun, right? So I talked about America's Got Talent, our, our desire to be entertained. Um, you know, that's undeniable. So we wanted something where not only are we going to do a lot of good to the community, but you're also going to have fun as part of, the, part of it, right? Um, so the capture, the, capture the Flag style contest, that CTF, you're very familiar with that. The gamification of that, of course, helped with the motivation for contestants to bring them in. And then, of course, celebrating with prizes and over social media as well. So a lot of social media um, during the event and after the event talking about how successful it was, and especially when teams do really great jobs. Making it transparent and open was also really important to us. So we wanted to get as far away from that closed system as possible so people can have the transparency, can see what's going on. Um, we wanted it to also be globally consistent. So right now what you'll see is it's very regionalized on how it works as far as process. So if we can make that more consistent globally, um, that would be really good. Um, we do event debriefs to continually improve uh, and social media announcements to be completely transparent on what we're doing and how it's working out. And then finally, 
Um, really following that hacker ethos as much as possible. Uh, we wanted to, and I struggled with this title of this slide, um, but, it, but it, you know, and I went back and forth on several, several words there, but making it beautiful, right? So if any of you are thinking about, uh, you know, an idea or a project, I would, I would um, ask, try to focus on this. This will usually keep you on the, on the track of both ethical, but then also something that's really great, right? So the global aspect of what we do means the ultimate mix of people. So to me, that's wonderful, right? You have, you have anybody that can participate. The virtual presence abstracts, you know, race, age, gender. So in most cases, we don't even know who you are, um, which is really interesting. Crowdsourcing allows scale, so that's really cost effective. Uh, we can go from one to a thousand people. Uh, barriers to entry are, are really non-existent, so there's no reason somebody can't really participate. If they don't have a computer or internet connection, they can borrow one or go somewhere where there is one. Uh, most people now have that. And then finally, the, the, the beautiful part about this, and being in search and rescue, I get to experience this quite a bit, is the united, uniting of families. So there's um, something really special when you see those two people come together where they thought they would never see each other again. Um, it's, it's very emotional. It's one of the most amazing things you can, you can witness. So some of the um, challenges that we've had. So um, recently you may have seen a video that came out by Freethink. A uh, great video. It kind of introduces what we do at Trace Labs. And, uh, but it became so popular it was uh, 2.7 million hits. Um, it, uh, it started to kill our website so we had to do some upgrades there. Um, so something as an entity, as a nonprofit, where we were starting to build and grow, there's things like this that we weren't really prepared for, um, which has made our, our journey even more interesting. Some concerns, some questions that we often get as an entity. Um, these are the top ones. How do we fund our operation? As a nonprofit, it's all donations. Um, how do we reduce the, the chance of causing harm? So this is a fantastic one that we've really struggled with a lot. We want to contribute. Uh, as much as we can and make this problem better. But at the same time, we have to also be very careful because that process has developed over many years and, and it's developed that way for a reason. And we're not experts in law enforcement, so we want to make sure we tread very carefully there. So we reduced our scope to uh, a very narrow focus to make sure that we didn't cause harm. And everybody wants to do more, everybody wants to do it better, everybody wants to help. And it's hard to pull that back sometimes, but we, we um, had to do that to make sure that we didn't interfere with law enforcement. So that brings me like to what is our scope? It's really the passive reconnaissance and we don't go any further. So people will often say, well, can I use this breach data, log in as them? No. Can I, uh, can I like their Facebook page and interact with them? No. Um, things like that. So that it's, it's, you know, we don't break any laws, but it's also, uh, a little bit more restrictive, right? So it's um, a lot of us want to go to that extra step, but we, uh, we can't do that. And then what if they don't want to be found? That's another really common question that we get. And so the people that we look for, we only look for people that the police have asked the public's assistance with. So if there is a, uh, a link on the internet where the police are saying, Can, we're looking for this person, if you have information, please contact us. That's really our calling card because it's, you know, we're the public, they're asking for the public's assistance. And uh, so on our intake form, that's one of our prerequisites that we ask people to, to put in there. Our progress has been pretty amazing. So we went from this idea to this amazing, great team that I work with um, that's doing some, some great things. And I'm really excited about it. These are some of the events we've done this year. Um, big thanks to all those event organizers for allowing us to do that. Um, and we've got a whole bunch more set up for, for future years. So it's been phenomenal growth. Um, which is great. There's been very few issues other than the growth problems, which has been fantastic. Some of the challenges, of course. So there's always, always some challenges. Um, you know, we, we didn't necessarily know how to run this business out of the gate. We've got a team of people now that are uh, really skilled in certain areas, which is definitely helping with that. Uh, the public didn't understand necessarily what we do. And you saw the pictures of the hackers. Um, our world is a bit of a mystery to them quite often. So allowing Articulating to them exactly what we're doing is, is, is very important. Um, people will sometimes be negative about stuff. You're going to have that no matter what you do. If you have any margin of success, there will be some people that are, are, are negative towards that. And the, we found the best thing to do was you can ignore some of it. And then you can also acknowledge some of it too. So if somebody's critical, you can say, hey, thanks for, for bringing that out. 
um, okay, yeah, that could be a problem. Um, thanks for your guidance. We're going to take those ideas and go work on that. Or, or would you like to come help us to, to fix it? Um, and then sometimes people also will want to um, take some credit for, for uh, what you're doing without contributing. That's some of the other issues we get. And then you also become a, a target as well. So you want to make sure you do your OPSEC early and, um, and make sure that it's hard to do that after the fact. So to kind of start to wrap up here, Hack the Planet was the, the title of my presentation. And it, to me, it's really a call to arms um, from the movie. If you remember the movie, it was so many years ago now. Um, you know, they were kind of joking when they were yelling it out. But you can see there's examples of where people are out in the world are actually using this as their, their slogan to go do good things, right? So there's a, um, some scientists trying to turn a ward off climate change. Um, there's Hack the Planet. That's a company out there. They're doing some amazing things. Uh, and there's a TV series now where they're, they're doing some, some amazing things as well that you can check out. So it's, it's starting to become a, a growing theme. So if you're thinking about this, if I've motivated you in any way to go out there and, and, and look at what we can do to uh, improve the world, these are some of the things that I would recommend. I mean, first, first thing, find something that, that pisses you off, right? Um, for me, um, this was a great one. Um, it irritated me that we were in this state. It felt kind of primitive. So there's a lot of technology out there that we can introduce to improve these things, right? Then seek to understand it. Understand the problem. Why is it that way? Um, it's, it, there's a lot of reasons why it's that way, and it usually doesn't have to be. Um, ignore the current authority on the issue. So quite often people will say, well, it's this way because it has to be this way and blah, blah, blah. And I find as hackers, we quite often want to take things apart and understand it, and we don't need the brochure that limits us to, oh, it's only good for this one thing. Um, don't get stuck on making it perfect. So our journey has been very iterative. It's been uh, continual improvement. So, and I think, really think that's one of the best ways to approach it. Don't try to make it perfect because it never will be, right? And to make sure you always stay on the right path, think about making it beautiful, right? Would you be proud of it? Do you want to show it to people? Right? Does it, is it something that people look at almost like a work of art, like, oh, this is amazing, right? So if you kind of keep that in mind, it definitely helps with your journey. All right, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any, any questions at all? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say um, it, it, it's your interpretation of beauty. Uh, I think definitely the cosmetics of when you look at something and you interact with it, does that feel good? Does it look good? I would say definitely for sure um, if you can do that. I think it's also bigger than that, right? So does it, does it make you feel good when you're engaged with it and when others are engaged with it? Um, as soon as it starts to not feel good that way and you start to question it, you're you've probably come off the track a little bit and you need to review what, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, it's, it's almost a philosophical way of looking at it. But you, it's, it's both, right? Thank you. Yes, sir. So we are, are focused globally. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I, I would say carefully yes. Uh, I've spoken to people in different countries and they've said, Rob, that'll never work here. Uh, and I think some countries are definitely going to be more challenging than others. Some countries have more risk. Some people, uh, some countries that are heavily populated are going to be more challenging as well. Uh, law enforcement works differently in every country. So very carefully I say yes, because I have hope that we can improve the situation everywhere. But I also acknowledge that it's, it's, it's going to be tricky. So, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much.